So, um, hello again. Welcome you all to the last session. Before introducing Professor Miro, that will be my great pleasure, we have a, a small tradition in our conferences, which is the last day we always acknowledge you in your own language, okay? This is going to take just a few minutes, Miro. Okay. So, in Argentinian, gracias. In Brazilian, obrigado. For Bulgaria, vlagodar, vlagodar, vlagodaria, vlagodaria, vlagodaria. There is someone from Bulgaria here. Vlagodaria. Say it again. Vlagodaria. Okay, vlagodaria. From China, xie xie. From Czech Republic, de kui. For Estonia, aita. For Finland, kitos. For France, merci. For Germany, danke. For Hungary, Kosonom. For Italy, mille grazie. For Japan, arigato. For Latvia, paldies. For Malaysia, terima kasih. For Mexico, gracias. For Norway, tak. For Poland, disinkuji, disinkuji. Zenkuja, thank you, zenkuja. For Portugal, obrigado. For Romania, multumesc, 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 multumesc. For Russia, spasibo. For Slovakia, da kujemban. For Slovenia, hafala. For South Africa, thank you. What is the South Africans? That's your language. Say it again, please. Ngos. Okay, Ngos. For South Korea, Hamza Kanida. For Spain, gracias, merce, in Catalonian, and aris, 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 ¿cómo dicen los vascos? Arris, catis, casco, ¿cómo es? Arric, casco, arric, 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 casco, pronto. In Sweden, tak, in the, de, in the, the Netherlands, vedant, vedanka, in the United Arab Emirates, Shukran Lak. For Uruguay, gracias. And for USA, thank you. So in the name of all my team, thank you very much for your presence here. And we hope really see you in 2020. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And so now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to a friend, a colleague, a fellow. We passed many things in our research life together. And uh, he, he is one of the greats in automation in analytical chemistry. And as a matter of fact, Professor Miro is going to delight us, to, to delight us today with um, a talk entitled Automated Flow, flow Based uh, Sample Preparation Exploiting 3D Printing Fluidic Platforms. Manuel, muito obrigado. Mr. Luis, many thanks for your unique conference, set of conference as always. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And first, also, I should thank the attendees to be here on the very last day. So I will try to make a kind of a critical lecture because my idea is to present to all of you what is the role of 3D printing nowadays in analytical chemistry compared with classical flow techniques. So then I will ask the help of Professor Bank to have some critical view what is the past and the future of flow-based techniques and in the microfluidics field, because we have heard a lot of possibilities of microfluidics. So see what 3D printing can offer better and what are the actual limitations. So the lecture actually is divided in several subsections. So the first is why, sorry, the first is why 3D printing has changed the PAT, the process analytical technology workflow, and how everything started. Why 3D printing is regarded as a cutting edge technologies, which are the main technologies which will help in automation of micro 
mealy and mesofluidic platforms. What is the area, the new area of microfluidics and flow injection based on 3D printing? How 3D printing will change sample prep? Then will be some unique applications on something that cannot be done in any other way if it is not by 3D printing. So how we can print sorbents for SPE, micro SPE, how we can print membranes for membrane-based separation, how we can print column systems for HPLC, CE, and microfluid separations. And then I will present for the first time what it is called the new generation of flow injection, which is called the 3D micro FIA, which is based on a versatile, unique platform for on-step, all integrated sample prep and on-chip detection based on 3D printing. And then, if I have time, I will go to some challenging applications in different fields, show how 3D printing can help in automation of liquid fine microstructure. We have some good researchers in that field. How we can implement microdialysis, micro SP in a set of applications. So how everything started. So the first slide is actually a classical PAT. PAT stands for Process Analytical Technology Workflow. So this is a figure from a technological process. So everything starts, we need starting materials to finish product. So what is the paradigm change in 3D printing? So as always, we start with one idea. Yes, we need an idea. How this idea can be transferred? Well, with 3D printing, it's much easier because you just need to have a 3D view because you just need 3D modeling. So the change in the PAT, the process analytical technology, is in the process number two, what we have is actually AutoCAD. We just need AutoCAD. You can 3D model everything in principle that you can imagine. So that is the paradigm change. We make actually the second process in our office. We don't need the lab. And from our office, we send by wireless the 3D, it's called the STL file, to the printer. So we don't need to go now to the lab or to the you know, industrial process because the third process is actually sending our file to the printer and the printer prints. So that is the revolution. We do everything sitting. So now maybe some of you is printing some stuff <laughs> at your home or in the lab. Maybe just sending by wireless your 3D file it's called STL, those who are working, to the printer. So the paradigm change actually means that <coughs> we could make fast prototyping. This is the best of 3D printing from homemade products. We don't need any more CNC milling. That's the revolution. We don't need any more clean rooms. So that could be really a revolution. Then we will see what are the drawbacks, obviously. We cannot do anything at the resolution that you get without a NICS. But everything has pros and cons. Next, we can easily, by 3D printing, reconfigure our object prior to the real industrial process, which is mass production. So it's clear, 3D printing cannot replace mass production. Obviously not, but can replace the fast prototyping. We can get extremely cheap products with extremely cheap printers. We cannot compare with the CNC classical milling stuff in the lab. It is probably a revolution for places with low resource settlings. We can make entirely new formats and also this could be the revolution at the university, at high schools for educational purposes. What are the main 3D printing technologies. Unfortunately, I have no time to go in deep detail, but I would like you to pay attention to three main 3D printing technologies which are revolutionizing 
the analytical chemistry. So the first, the most common in analytical chemistry is FDM, is here, fused deposition modeling, using a solid rod, this is the solid rod, PLA, ABS, which goes through extrusion, and then it melts and solidify. So it is additive manufacturing, not negative manufacturing. So we are adding layer by layer. This is the first simple 3D printing technology. More advanced technology is the one here at the bottom, esterolithography, which is abbreviated as SLA or DLP. DLP is digital light processing based on the use of a projector as a light source. Here, stereolithography, we are working with a liquid photopolymer, and we will see, we can change our liquid, liquid photopolymer, mixing with some other stuff for sample prep, that will be. We can implement some nanomaterials in this liquid photopolymer. So actually, we can print our materials for SPE, L LPME as a supports. And here, the difference is that in FDM, we have a solid rod which is melting, and in the stereotography, we have a liquid polymer which by UV light or laser is solidified. It's the opposite way. Here we are melting, here we are solidifying drops. So our liquid resin is actually solidifying in layers. Again, additive layer production. And the last one, which is even more advanced, so I have been going from one to three also in terms of costs. You can get FDM printers for less than 1,000 euros. You get SLA printers of less than, than 5,000 euros. And more advanced inject printing, so I take the chance to give you two standard companies producing polyjet or multi-jet, which is summarized as a type of inject printing. We have, in this case, it is so-called multi-material printing. It's simply like in your printer. You are printing black, green, yellow, cyan. So this is the same. You replace your cartridge with some material which are printing. So in this case, we have inject printing of a build material and support material. Obviously, we need in 3D printing some supports, otherwise the structures cannot be stable in a 3D view. So this is more advanced printing, which can be seen here. This is inject printing based on point-wise deposition, like a printer, you are inject printing, and then the layers are UV curable. That's the limitation of our inject materials, should be UV curable to make it solid. And build again the layer like in the former two types of printers. So far, it means everything can be replaced by 3D printing, right? Not. We have some limitation. What are the limitations? So we must be critical with pros and cons. Limitation that when we get our printout, we cannot directly go into the lab, no. Because we must have some post-processing steps after the printing. Because some of the photopolymers needs further curation, post-curing. Because otherwise, these monomers or photoreactant um, oligomers will be leached. So then someone will ask, what reagent solvents we can use. So wait, wait a minute. What solvents we can use in our 3D printing chip devices. So another problem is that I mentioned that to build a 3D structure, sometimes you need support because in this case, there is a moving platform and in this moving platform, here you have shoes, but in some other cases, you need some support because they need to be grow on the platform. So after printing, you have to remove the supports which actually, these more expensive printers do not work for microfluidics because there is no way to remove the supports into the channel after printing. So that's a problem. We must remove carefully and completely the supports or supporting material after printing. So there are some limitations that people are working to overcome them. 
So if we continue to be more, there is a revolution in the microfluidics area. We have seen nice presentations. Professor Binhu and other people around this room have been working on designing nice platforms. So there is a revolution in the microfluidic arena. And here, in this slide, the idea is to compare from this nice Angevante review the soft lithography against stereolithography. So this is the classical microchip production against the advanced 3D printing. So you can see that in soft lithography, the idea is to prepare a mold, to prepare bonding of different states, and then prepare the tubing to assemble all in one piece. So this is a multi-step way of producing chips. In 3D printing, you don't need a multi-step any longer. With 3D printing, you can have a one-step, a single chop, unibody print. So all is done at the same time. Because you are actually producing solid parts and leaving void volumes without printing. That's the beauty. So in that case, we are simply printing layers, not printing the inner parts of a chip device. And then we can make a flexible home designs. Yes, because I said, we can make a fast prototyping. So if Maria is making um, a STL design, 3D printing, she can send to another university, make another design, and print at the same time. And we can print the same model worldwide now, because we just need to have the STL file, which is universal way of communication between printers. So also we have the printer communication. Obviously, there are some drawbacks which nicely are presented in this slide. The classical microfluidic way of production has better resolution than 3D printing, yes. So in 3D printing, it is the best choice, not for microfluidics yet, but meso or millifluidics, which is good for sample prep, because we need larger channels to make our sample preparation and sample handling inside. The good thing, again, is that this is based on digital design. You don't need clean room facilities. That's, I would say, it's a hot point to highlight. This is a cutting cage of 3D printing. We can print in our lab, yes. And the limitation that you can see, he, see here from this already two years ago, they claim that the materials were limited compared with the chip design, classical. This is not true any longer. We are, people is producing new photopolymers, which simply is a blend of different photopolymerized oligomers. Let's see some examples of how it is evolved, how 3D printing has evolved over the years. So you can see here on the left hand side that there is some evolution, this is actually a stop in 2015 on purpose, because we have seen some evolution since this time, because at the beginning, let's say about eight, nine years ago, 3D printing was born with the idea to have a simple microfluidic chips, to combine chips one after the other, you will see, and then make a simple biological reaction, but then we'll see that this now can be extended to sample prep, and column separation systems on a chip. So the first example is in the microfluidics arena, where here I took two previous examples. One on the left-hand side, that is possible to print gradient generators and reactor chambers. These gradient generators, which actually came from flow injection and never succeed, they are succeeding in microfluidics for cell separation and having a kind of on-chip cell you know, gradient in the, in the channel. Here you can see different, one, two, three, four, five, six, six different print platforms which are simply bound one to the other to have some versatile sample introduction on the chip and different designs which cannot be easily done by milling. Milling, some colleagues show that, for example, when you are working in a membrane-based liquid phase micro 
liquid phase extraction, you need to print the two platforms and glue one to the other. We don't need glue anymore because actually the polymer works as the best glue we can have. So this is a good possibility to have, let's say, one step module for membrane separation for hollow fiber microstructure. So I have one example later on. And also we can have a print out valve. There are several examples. Professor Bing Hu show on his lecture nice designs of microfluids that you can have open closed valve. This can be done also easily by 3D printing using the so-called unidirectional control pressure valve, where there are some printout. I will not go too much detail into the design, but simply allow direction in one way and not in the other way. So this can be done mechanically. Mechanically, by moving parts, you can stop flow in one direction. So this, some call, sometimes are called the pinch valve, can be printed out in a polymer fashion. The question is, can 3D printing have a revolution in flow analysis? Actually, and Professor Bank for sure agrees, we need a revolution in flow analysis. Flow analysis is at the steady state, yes. We need to change. So how we can change our classical, let's say, flow injection platform on this side? Yes, we can change because now, now we can print out different modules for flow analysis. We can actually print sample introduction. We can print our nuts and our T pieces of any material. We can print our columns. We can print our reactors. We can print our flow cells. Even we can print our fluorimeters. There are some nice examples in the literature. I haven't taken it to you, but from Czech Academy of Science, the group, well, one of the groups where Pavel works, they have an ethical chemistry paper on printing a fluorimeter, LED-based fluorimeter by printing monochromators as well, or by printing filters to have fluorimetric assays. So there is a potential revolution in flow analysis. This is for a group in France that now they are working on a modular FIA components for a easy detection of lead in some natural samples. Let's go one step further. Let's go on the possibility, this is done in my group, that we are printing, try to print different designs of T pieces, different components to help in a flow injection um, setup. Next step is, we also need a revolution on sequential injection analysis. Sequential injection analysis, those who are not working on flow analysis, it's, it was regarded as, as advanced flow analysis where we have more computer-based approach, based on a computer-controllable valve with a syringe. That was some advance already 30 years ago. How this can be improved? Yes. 3D printing can help to change. Now you will see a photo of a 30 years old SIJ module that Professor Bank and me work in Denmark with that module, which appears now. And now we can change this. We can change this 30 years ago setup, sorry, that needs pump, selection valve, Pristalty pump, because this can be changed. How this can change? We can print all the components. We can replace the classical distribution, distribution valve on top of the syringe by 3D printing valve, yes. Now we can do multiple, multiple channels on the valve at one time. We can also replace the valve, which each valve costs 1,500 euros. Each VC, Valco valve, if you buy in the market, is 15, 1,500 euros. We can actually change everything to a single, a single module, which is called a standalone SIA system. This is done in our group with collaboration of Professor Binhu that actually what we have done is we simply need a standalone pump. We have replaced 
the classical on top distribution valve, but having different functionalities. So I cannot go into detail, but if you go to this recent paper, you will see, this recent paper, that this valve works as a selection valve, as injection valve, as a distribution valve. So everything is done in a single 3D printed stator, which is now magnified in the next figure. This is actually how everything works. We just need a standalone syringe and a multiple function valve. This valve works as a selection valve with a holding coil, as a distribution valve, and as a selection valve. So everything is integrated in a single valve where we can have everything you need. Simply, the, the, limi the, limitation, sorry, the limitation is that everything needs to enter into the syringe, so we need to have some cleanup because the syringe is aspirating and dispensing to make the sample prep. I will go further to the sample prep in this slide, but now focus on the possibilities of integration of selection valve, diverting valve, everything in a single 3D printed state. That's the revolution on poten potential sample handling in a flow analysis system. Next step, let's go to the so-called third generation of flow system, the so-called lap on a valve. Lap on a valve is the same you have seen so far, but the idea is to replace the valve stator by the transparent, you can see here, multi-channel platform to implement in a millifluidic format all the sample prep and all the liquid handling. So the question is, how many of you are aware of the Lepono valve, say, mode of sample prep? So Professor Capello and Professor Bank. Maybe also some of my colleagues in Spain. So why a Lepono valve has no reach, let's say, to the maturity that lap on a chip has reached. So I have an explanation for that. So far, we can count with our fingers, hands, and feet that only worldwide, 20 groups, maximum 20 groups worldwide, so me, Professor Bank, Professor Capello, three groups, out of 20, work on lap on a valve. Why? Because if you go to this company, and you want to buy one lap on a valve, they will ask you, please pay 4,000 euros. Yes, that's a problem. A single machine valve, polymeric valve, costs 4,000 euros. Well, it's not possible to every lab can play around with 4,000 euros. So you can see what is the next step. Let's print out. Let's print out and let's make it cheaper, and everyone can print with the same file to any university, any industry in the world. So here it is, the revolution, that this is just my recent, just accepted paper, on the revolution of 3D printing that I call, it is the second dawn of lap on a lab, lab on a valve fluidic platforms as the fourth generation of 3D printing FIA. And here you can see the 3D model to you, this is actually what we have printed out. We have printed a single module, sorry, a single module where we can have a transparent millifluidic platform for membrane extraction, solvent extraction, electrochemical detection, optical detection on a valve, and this costs 11 euros per platform. And we can print at the time for lap on a valve on the same on the same run because we have a platform so we can actually make multiple copies in a single printout. So there's potential of revolution and potential to expand to community this new millifluidic platform. And here you can see how everything works. This is the real picture of our printout that we can implement some membrane separation. We have some electrochemical detection in valve, optical detection in valve, and we can have some even batch flow reactors to have different applications that we have actually shown in our paper. We can have a membrane, sorry of this misspelling, we can have a skin type, skin type separation in this container, so we can insert transwell, transwell membranes 
to have a kind of cell-based toxicity testing. We can actually grow the CACO2 cells and make cytotoxicity effects online. We demonstrate that we can have phospholipid removal in lab on above. So actually, we use a commercial available Oasis Prime, which is a kind of zirconium-based um, material for removal of phospholipids. We demonstrate on-chip electrochemistry by having stripping voltammetry on the chip and also the possibility of leaching soil material. This is actually a pack. This is not soil, but it's a pack material which can be actually used as SPE or as a sample. The main question would be some drawbacks regarding solvent compatibility. So surprisingly, and I will address you some examples, this SLA printout has good solvent compatibility, better than silicon. So we can actually improve the quality of the classical silicon-based, PDMS-based microchips because this printout accepts concentrated acids and alkalis. Concentrated means six molar, could be okay. Octanol, so thinking about my colleagues on liquefied microstructure, we can have octanol in there. We can have acetonitrile, exane, and toluene. So actually, we can have actually using non-water mixable solvents. The only limitation, actually, surprisingly, is the low-chain polar solvents. And for methanol, is somehow a limitation that we overcome when we make separations by replacing methanol with acetonitrile as a water mixable solvent. What about sample prep? So I will skip this. What's about sample prep? So actually, we have two papers in track that I will ask you to go into detail. This is a paper from the group in Tasmania that they show that 3D printing can, al can have excellent contribution in separation science. So this group from Brett Paul is printing columns, is printing electrophoretic plates, is printing TCL, TLC plates by polymers. And also, I have recently a review in track that is the base of my lecture. So, thanks, Stick, for accepting the paper, the possibility of 3D printing in sample prep. So, in this paper, I discuss the possibility of having 3D printed millifluidic platforms for membrane separation, for SPE, and for also easy, let's say easy, column separation on a chip. This is actually the summary of the idea of 3D printing in a flow-based mode, that we can replace the classical FIA by membranes which are printed in the fluidic system, solvent extraction, actually these are two magnets to retain magnetic nanoparticles, and also this is a, two, a 3D printed coil column separation system, which the group from Tasmania has some polymer inside to have quite nice column separation system based on polymer monoliths printed in the column. Some examples from the literature is shown here. Possibility to print out different channels, containers to have SPE separation. Actually, this is a nice example from the group in Brazil using the 3D printing for they call preto pro I would say petrolomics. Petrolomic, petrolomic is to study the different um, molecules from petroleum extraction, from fuel extraction. And here, there's a nice example from the group in the States that they use a multiple inserts. So these inserts are used for some membrane, from some cell processing in a flow system. Usually, this is study, in this simple design is study for drug permeation in a flow system under dynamic conditions. I have some examples that I would like to show you. This is from my group. The possibility is to print out from now on, sorry, sorry. It's possible to print out square channels. That is the beauty of 3D printing. We don't need to print circular cylindrical channels. We can print any shape you want. So we can have also 
square channels, which could be good for some turbulent flow stuff. This is the simple design we have done for magnetic micro SPE chip. So we pack magnetic nanoparticles, we actually design a holder for the two magnets, and this is implemented in a flow-based system to make the sample prep, to make sample preconcentration, clean up, and illusion prior to HPLC. So the idea here is to have a single module for, and this I would say sometimes could be single use stuff because print out some channel, it's a printed channel, cost few euro cent, and to avoid carryover, it's better to throw away and to use a new one. So this is actually the idea of have disposable platforms for sample prep in a flow system. I will skip this. Then I go to another example about liquid frame microstruction. This is a recent example from our group where we have carbon nanofiber reinforced hollow fiber. So this is a conventional polypropylene hollow fiber. This is modified with carbon nanofibers and we print out actually our holder. Our holder to insert for dynamic liquid frame microstruction a single fiber modifier with nanofibers into a flow system. So everything looks like that. We have so-called carbon nanofiber reinforced hollow fiber with a single hollow fiber inserted into this now homemade printout polymer-based holder. Then we can play with different dimensions. This is the beauty of flow analysis. You can print out different size, different diameters. And here, simply, I will focus on this part of integrating a single hollow fiber liquid frame microstruction. This is the three-phase liquid frame microstruction for some um, well, from acidic drugs in urine prior to online HPLC using a core shell column separation for better resolution. So I have only one minute left, so probably Capella will give me five minutes more. Because now I have five more unique applications. Just five. <laughs> Just five. Now I will show applications that only can be done by 3D printing to convince you that maybe we all need to move for any application to have a simple, let's say, holders, devices to help in our common life. Not only university, it could be also in, at home. So, first application of the unique possibilities of 3D printing. This is from a group, I think it is, sorry, this group is from, I think it's Taiwan, from Taiwan, that actually they nicely show that the photopolymer resin containing acrylate monomers actually is the best sorbent material for, tri for trace elements. So actually, these authors, you can see here, print out, this is 2D, this is 3D, print out cubes, cubes, mesh, 3D mesh, and each cube works as a sorbent material. So they use the acrylate as cathione changer. And that's a very nice example, I will say, of using the photopolymer resin containing acrylate as mesh preconcentrator the concentration of trace elements. So this is the design they built. They built the, the screws. They built these two columns for large sample volume trace element preconcentration from seawater. So I was really impacted from this paper, from this group, because they show how easily now we can use the same resin for some preconcentration. They use as ionic change. Now, also, I would recommend it's possible to use the same resin as a reverse phase, as a polar reverse phase. So maybe actually we are now re having a revolution on, I would say, a helic, a helic 3D printing material for any polar-based separation. Second example, that's also also unique from the same group in Taiwan, is the possibility to have a nanomaterial printed based 
pre-concentrator. So this group actually what have done, I will focus on this figure, they incorporated titanium dioxide nanoparticles into the liquid resin and then photopolymerized. So they have this that the titanium dioxide nanoparticles functionalized polymer, embedded. So this is probably the best way to have embedded solvent. So maybe now I have some ideas for our Spanish colleagues from Cordoba, because we can now have easily way to mix our photopolymer with nanoparticles. This is the titanium dioxide, but could be carbon or whatever, by the 3D printing process. And then, in this case, the authors, what they produce, you can see in this slide, they produce monolithic platforms. Before they produce, sorry, before they produce here, a monolithic, sorry, before here they produce a kind of monolithic they call cuboids, a layer of order of cuboids. Now they produce a monolithic nanoparticle based material, which is here. And then they show just a nice application, but the application is not so relevant of the pos possibility of speciation, arsenic and selenium by pH adjustment. What the beauty is, is to print out the column holder to have the monoliths and all integrated because you can now have the whole of the column which fits to your monolith. So now we can print the holder for monoliths. So we don't need anymore the classical, you know, single design monolithic holders, columns. So we can print our columns for low pressure, for low pressure chromatography. Third example of showing the unique possibilities of 3D printing for sample prep. So the next is the possibility of using nanomaterials in flow systems. So this is an example from a group, I think, in Netherlands, where they synthesized nano MIPS. You can see, usually, I think it's less than 400 na nanometers. And then what they print out is the mesh for flow through sample preconcentration. 400 nanometers is difficult to hold on a filter. So Professor Lucena showed different possibilities or have filters to support nanoparticles. But in a flow through mode, it's even more difficult because you must be sure that the nanoparticles do not flow through, do not wash through with the solvent out. So what they did is here, they print 3D scaffolds. This is a mesh with a polymer. And you can see what is the size of one of these holes, less than 400 microns. So actually, what they show, probably this is a mistake, actually. This is a mistake, because this should be, sorry, this should be nanometers, probably. Yeah. Maybe it's, maybe it's some mistake in this slide, but the idea, but the idea is that they have. The idea is that they have a 3D printed scaffolds with polymer networks for holding nanoparticles for flow through SP. So uh, I will go back to this because it's copy paste from the from the paper, but probably there are some dimension issues here. But this is the idea that nano sized particles can be supported, nano-sized particles can be supported on 3D printed scaffolds. The fourth application is to move on membrane-based separation. And this is a paper from the group in Tasmania that they show using this dual print printing material printer that they, in one step, can print ABS microfluidic device and can print the dialysis membrane. What they do, you can see here, they have two materials. This is inject printing. They have ABS and so-called lay-fed material, which is the yellow. This yellow material is a composite filament which becomes porous when it is in touch with water. So this is a composite containing a water-soluble material that when Flashing with water, leave a mesh for dialysis. So I would say there's a unique application that you can use the polymer material, because some are water soluble, to print out in situ 
your own dialysis membrane, and this is how everything looks like, that you can print the membrane with the printer, and this is simply to show that it's possible to have separate isolated channels and transfer from one to the other. So that's a revolution on sample prep, because now everyone could print the device and can print the membrane. The last example, it's also the possibility of having PDMA, PDMS, PDMS module for gas separation, for diffusive gas separation. So the yellow, this orange, sorry, this orange is actually a microfluidics channel-based setup containing one millimeter thick sorry, a gas diffusion membrane pre produced by digital light processing. So what they did is they can print a module with channels for CO2 transfer, and in the acceptor channel, simply they have indicator changing from blue to orange. So there is diffusion from CO2 that acidifies the, this is a nice example, easy example to show that can be transfer of CO2 from one channel to the, this is uh, bromotimol blue dye that change from blue to orange when acidified with CO2. So the idea is single setup can contain, the same setup can work as a gas diffusion module. So as a conclusion, we can say as a perspective that nowadays with the new desktop printers, we can have better resolution of fluidic devices at affordable prices. As a perspective, now there are papers showing that in the lab, you can produce your custom formulation that open new possibilities, not only depending on proprietary resins, which are more expensive and of a known composition. There are some work to be done, still by groups, to avoid the leaching of monomers from the printout. Still, there is a need to produce new materials to prevent absorption of organic species, because the material can work as a reverse phase solvent. That's a problem for hydrophobic species. Hydrophobic species cannot be easily handled by printouts. They will be absorbed. So in our liquefied microstructure, we need to put some methanol in our donor to avoid absorption on the walls of the printout. It's possible, actually, playing with chemistry. This is here. It's possible to tailor the surface chemistry of interior channels by grafting. Then we can have new chemistries. And finally, the 3D prints can be used for challenging samples like wastewater because they can allow sample prep. So finally, thanks, Professor Jose Luis Capello, for inviting me. Thanks, people from my group. Thank the Ministry of Spain. And as always, inviting first Jose Luis and then to all of you to visit us in Mallorca. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Manuel. Outstanding talk. It seems that the future comes in 3D. And so we are open for questions. So everybody is so impressed that there is no questions. I, I, uh, I have one very basic, maybe, because um, how easy is it to interface these devices uh, with uh, automation in, uh, in terms of uh, electrospray? Mass spectrometry, I mean. So in principle, we're working at the standard flow rates of flow injection. But you can go a bit down, so still it's difficult to have uh, reliable microfluidic chips. I haven't shown, but there is one group in the States that they show that they produce own prints, own resins, with extremely high resolution, playing around with the reliability of the laser. So in principle, it's possible to have millifluidic flow, let's say a few hundred uh, microliters per minute, but you can also go to 
high nanoliters per minute using these new prints and new, new printers and new materials. So in principle it's possible but not yet done. There are some paper, there are some authors actually which work in paper spray, but the, I think they are doing is a kind of holder. So we need to check also with my colleagues the three D printing papers on uh, facilitating paper spray MS ionization. Basically on holders. So most of the work is done on holders and less on microfluidics because one of the printers, which is the most uh, cheap, has a problem of sometimes leaking when you are pumping flow. So the stability of the walls with high pressure is very poor. So even at low pressure, some of the platforms leaks because the polymer is not solidified enough. So that's the limitation of some printers that high flow rate is not good and low flow rate is difficult because small channels sometimes collapse when you print out. Yes, there is one question over there. Thank you for a nice presentation. And I wonder, first, what was the cost of uh, equipment? And also about uh, in-house experience. Do you need a special experience, personal and so on? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Let's go back. Maybe I cannot go. Yes, yes. So I go to the first slide. So actually, first limitation is that you must have some experience in AutoCAD. So nowadays, I'm trying with my master students, which they like to play, play, you know, play and play. So actually, most of the designs are done by young students because they love to play with AutoCAD. So actually, the, the best designs are done by undergrad students or master students because this is the first limitation. You must have a reliable, a reliable 3D design which could be printed out. So the printer also advises you sometimes that your your format will never print out because have some, you know, they say incompatibility. So the printer itself is clever enough to say this model cannot be printed out. So the first limitation is that obviously we need to have some experience in AutoCAD. There are other softwares I haven't shown. Some are freeware, so we are, we are not using AutoCAD. We are using 1,2D, 1,2,3D, which is cheap. Sorry, cheap, it's free. And some are low cost, which is Triscam or Rhinoceros. So I, I know many companies working on Rhino or Rhinoceros software for 3D models. So this is the limitation that you might have the model. Then about the price, we are usually recommending stereotography. This is the printer. I don't want to make any commercial advice, but this printer, I pay less than 4,000 euros three years ago. Less than 4,000 euros. This other printer cost less than 1,000 euros, but sometimes it's not good for fluidics because it leaks. This other printer, which is Polyjet or multi-jet, you can get now for about 50,000 euros for desktop. This is more advanced. You can have multi-material, but this is a limitation of this printer. This printer can only have a single material at a time because you can see this here, a platform, and you have a liquid resin here. The platform is here. The platform goes down and then rise while producing the object because the laser is from bottom to up. This is bottom up fabrication. So your object is also upside down produce that you need to cut. Next limitation, here. You need definitely post processing steps because you need to cure your fresh object. So 
I cannot explain you some developments because we are now trying to publish how we can fast cure our objects. So this could be done, just one idea, with a more powerful laser. So, so Manuel, um, before the question of Hugh, of um, Carlos, let me ask you something. Let's say uh, more than half of the people in this room is not very aware about how to handle uh, these kind of devices because they don't have experience in, in them, but they want to try to give a jump to these, to these methodologies to implement their labor daily laboratory work in, 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 uh, in 3D. We want to start. Which one do you recommend us to begin? Because I think that just to begin using the last one will be uh, perhaps extremely complicated. Yeah, so this is what happened with us. We started with this middle price printer, which is here. This is actually the print that we are now recommending. This is the printer. This is stereolithography. This is from, I don't want to make any commercial announcement, but this is Formlabs, Formlabs company. You can get similar from five, six companies worldwide. Even more advanced than this one. And the price of this one is? About At the moment, about 4,000 euros. 4,000 4, euros. This is very affordable. Yeah. So we are going to set a special session in 2020 for 3D. OK? We'll see. So uh, Carlos has a question. Yes, congratulations, Manuel. It was amazing, your talk. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you, because we need to go uh, with the science to reduce price. Because in the science, everything is very cost. But also to reduce waste and discard the material. So how long is reusable this kind of, uh, of materials? Because Price could be cheaper, but we cannot use material for one use and then discard. We we can use the non non photo non photopolymerized resin can be reused because actually here you cannot see, but usually you need a cartridge. So it's like a commercial printer. We have one liter one liter liquid resin. This is a clever design because. You have here a cartridge, and when the printer needs, this is a kind of rechargeable printer. So this printer is the second model that only use the liquid resin when there is a lack of liquid resin in the platform. So they, the printer fills the platform only when it needs. And the extra liquid, which is actually not non-polymerized, can be reused. For how long? Less than one week. But usually, we are producing, in one day, as many devices as possible. So you can do it in 24 hours. And you simply process afterwards. The same device, send device means the printout. Sometimes the best would be single use. This is the best. But with, with our more advanced Lapon Bath platform, so actually, we have one platform we have been using for, let's say, um, 100 times, depending on the solvent, depending on the chemistry you are doing, obviously. But the affordable thing is you can throw away after use because cost, euro, cent, single platform. The, the easiest one, not the more complicated. Is there any other question in the room? No? Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Thank Professor Manuel Miró, for this outstanding talk. <laughs>